I was motivated to tell the story because it's my family's personal experience. It's, it's my own experience. I was very young when we left, um, when we were expelled. Um, I was three and a half when Idi Amin announced the expulsion order. And then um, my family had a, a quite a circuitous route. We left before the deadline. Uh, it was a, there was a three month deadline um, during which all South Asians had to leave. And so we did leave at that point, but we made our way back to Kampala for some time. And then we lived in, in Kenya for a bit. So there were about three years of my life that were um, in movement. <laughs> and um, it, it, was, it was confusing um, in, on a logistical level for me as, as, a, as a child and then growing up, even though I had quite a stable growing up after that when we settled in Canada. Um, but there was a lot of um, emotion uh, I, I felt contained in, in me uh, about that period. And so it was kind of this, the, the story of Uganda and, and back home, as, as my family would, would talk about it for, for, for a number of years. At some point that phrase actually fell out of the family vocabulary, but um, they, they would refer to back home. And I, I have charged but fleeting memories of it. and, and um, even as a small child, I liked to tell stories. I always wanted to be a writer as long as I can remember. So I, I, I sensed early on that this was a story that I wanted to tell um, as a writer, but also emotionally, I, I felt I needed to tell it. And um, so in various ways, it was, it was there. I, 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 I'm a, a news junkie. I've always in, enjoyed politics. And so I, I sort of veered into journalism. Um, but part of that was because I wanted to be a writer and, and I didn't think uh, creative writer would make much money, so I went the journalist route, but the story was there, it was there, and um, finally I was able to, um, I was able to tell it, and um, as I sat down to do it, I, I, I realized there were even more reasons why I wanted to tell it, and, and one, one, one that developed as, as, I, as I worked through it um, was to convey to the reader um, what the East African experience, it really the, the African experience meant to Asians. The, the historical books I would read about Uganda would maybe mention the Asians in a paragraph or two as having been, you know, they came, they were traitors, they got kicked out, uh, that was it. And um, that's, you know, there's a lot of history of the Asian contribution. And so I, I wanted to share that and, and the tragedy, it heightens the tragedy of the expulsion. I did a lot of reading uh, about Ugandan political history, uh, pre-colonial and colonial and, and, and post-colonial. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think at what point in the writing of the novel. That didn't actually come until I'd already started to write. I'd, I'd, I'd been in contact with, um, I was actually living in East Africa at, at the, the time that I wrote the book. I'd gone to move there. I'd gone to live there with my, uh, my husband and kids. We all took off um, and, um, and spent a year there. but. In fact, the, my research material primarily came from here, uh, from libraries here, and, um, and I was communicating with my father by email at that point, um, just, just to get dates of, uh, family dates, like when my grandfather came to um, East Africa, when he came to Uganda, just, just so I had a general idea. And so I'd started to write the narrative, um, and I was well into it before I started to, to, to do some heavy duty reading into the, into the um, Ugandan politics. But I, I probably read about three or four political history books. There, there were two books in particular. Um, one was by a journalist. Um, it wasn't so much political history as, as current events. It was written in 1973 and it's called General Amin. Um, and I found that one was very useful just to get a sense of the real details of what was going on just prior to Amin's coup. And, and what happened in the in the first few years, um, and the other one is uh, called "State of a State of Blood" by Henry Kayemba, uh, I believe is his name, and he was a um, a minister in the Ugandan um, government um, prior to Amin's coup, and so he had some insider um, information, and, and also in the early years of Amin's time, he was he was in government. So, um, so that was my formal research. And then, and then when I was actually largely finished the manuscript, I was back home in Canada, I did a microfiche research and I used um, mostly Globe and Mail articles that, um, that just depicted what, how Canada was reacting to what was going on in Uganda. So I'm an Ismaili Muslim, that's a community I, I come from um, that I, I 
felt I had some authority to write about just because it's my experience. Um, there's, you know, M.G. Vasanji writes about the Ismaili community um, as well. There, are, there, are, there has been some. Um, there are other novelists in Canada who have who have um, written stories that involve the community. Um, I, I, I told it because that 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 was my personal story, and. Um, also, from a Canadian perspective, the, the majority of Asians that came from Uganda were Ismailis. Uh, not all, um, but the majority was. And so it, it felt more Canadian um, to me. Um, so the, that's largely why, why I focused on, on Ismailis. There were always a, a racial tensions in, in um, post-colonial Uganda, and, and so they were Roger and Untaz were discussing. Um, they, they were discussing this racial tension, and, and um, Roger's response to Mumtaz was, um, um, "If you um, if you love, live somewhere and you and you honor the place and you honor the people living there, it's home." Uh, you, you know, she was she was sort of caught up in this uh, Africa is for Africans, India is for Indians, idea of home, and and he challenged this, and and um, uh, I, I would. Yeah, you know, at that point, he, it's a character speaking, but at that point, I think it's safe to say that I'm um, comfortable with that view, that, that um, yeah, I certainly don't believe in, in race-defining um, nationality. Um, so as far as the Ismaili community uh, in Canada, I, I would say in Canada and, and, and uh, in Uganda, anywhere, Ismailis have, I, I think, I th the benefit of, um, and I see it as a benefit, of not having ever been in, a, in, in, in the majority anywhere in, in a country on earth. They, so, they, so they don't have this, they're not looking longingly back to some promised land, to some sense of home elsewhere. They're, they're continually open wherever they live to make that place their home. And I, and I think, um, you know, this has meant persecution uh, uh, in Ismaili history, but, it, but it's also meant um, a, a really an incredible uh, ability to adapt and a willingness to adapt. And, and so I think, um, um, but that's played out in Canada. The overall arc of the story, right from the beginning, right from when Raju leaves um, Gujarat, uh, follows m my family's experience. My grandfather left uh, his hometown in the early 1920s, as, as Raju does, settled in Uganda, and. Um, Spent about half a century there, and then and then were expelled, um, and then and then uh, the family largely ended up in um, my family, uh, my immediate family ended up in Kitchener, uh, Ontario. Uh, s some extended family members ended up in the UK. Uh, quite a large number did there. Um, um, it, the book relates the experience of um, Roger's older son. Uh, Baku and his family first arriving in Kitchener, um, f first arriving actually in, in Montreal, um, where they had set up, uh, the Canadian Army had set up a sort of refugee center. And the, the experience that Baku has uh, in the book is ver very much uh, like the experience um, relatives of mine had when they arrived. My, my, my father took it, as I said, we had a different kind of experience, a different route, but. Um, Relatives of mine did come on the, uh, on an airlift early on, uh, arrived at this refugee center in Montreal, and um, and then ended up in, in Kitchener, very much like Baku, because they didn't really know the country. They were open to living somewhere that wasn't a big city, and Kitchener was suggested, and they were put in a train and, and, and welcomed, uh, and, and, and received a lot of extraordinary extraordinarily kind community-level support um, when they arrived. Uh, there was also, uh, larger uh, support in, in the form of, um, just like that refugee center, the, the Canadian Army had, had trained uh, their cooks to make Indian food, for example, so that when, when people first arrived, um, they would feel comfortable, they would have familiar food. Uh, and in fact, the, the, um, the setup in Kampala that, that was processing um, Ugandan Asians uh, was uh, uh, remarkably organized and uh, more important, more importantly, the um, the energy behind it from the Canadian officials was was welcoming. Um, Pierre Trudeau was the prime minister of the time, and and he um, there was a phrase he used um, 
we, we will offer these people an honorable place in Canadian society. And, and that, you know, I've spoken to, to some of the people who, some of the um, Canadian immigration officers of the time, and, the, and they, they talked about how that sort of permeated every level of, 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 um, of the organization uh, in Kampala. Because it was a, there was no diplomatic office. Uh, Canada didn't have one in Kampala. They had to set one up temporarily to get people processed and get them out very quickly. And so um, it, it was done with this, um, with this, for lack of a better word, kind uh, um, and, and respectful energy. And, and that was what um, so many of us experienced when we came. Um, on the flip side, it was also the early 1970s. Kitchener, for example, was, was quite white. Um, and there was confusion and distress, I would say, to these, to these newcomers. Um, yeah, it was, um, there, there was a fair bit of that. Uh, and it um, was challenging, but because there was this um, official welcoming, I, I think that that, that helped uh, enormously um, when people were settling. I tend to think of it, um, and, I'm, and I'm thinking of it in abstract terms, not sort of um, politically, uh, I think of it as an openness and um, um, an absence of fear, or, or at least a smaller levels of fear of the other. And so, that, so recognizing that it's actually a privilege to have um, many cultures um, nearby. Just being open um, and, and seeing that those who are different have something to offer you, to, to see that, that somebody um, unlike me has something to teach me, I think. And, and I, I, I think that generally speaking, um, Canadians um, do have an openness, you know, uh, just because we've all, with the exception of the indigenous population, we've all come from somewhere else. And, and so we, we would presumably be sympathetic to people in the, in the, same, in the same situation. I, you know, I don't, I guess I don't differentiate it. I, the Canadian uh, is distinct from other citizens of the world, which, which is something that I think the novel gets at, and, and, and which is um, why I called it Where the Air is Sweet. It's, it's, it's a, um, it's, it's, there's, there's not sort of one place where that's the case. You're sort of open to maybe the air is sweet somewhere else for you um, right now. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to, to think of nationalism, Canadianism in, 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 in that way, which is why I'm struggling with this question. But yeah, I, I, would, say, I would say it's more of, it's, it's more of just human qualities of, of being open and welcoming and, um, and trusting. I think that sense of, um, adaptability and that that you can be who you who you are in in this country and um, that the two things the two things can go together that you know you're not giving up one you're not giving up who you are because you're trying so hard to adapt I think that I've, I've seen you know my particularly my older relatives because I think for my generation we were so young that it was much easier um, culturally to, to adapt um, but I have seen you know, a retention of, of the languages, of the, the food, the music, uh, South Asian, even, even uh, African, um, but still feeling thoroughly Canadian and feeling perfectly entitled to call themselves Canadian. I think that's, that's been a lovely example.